Sylvia and me. 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 I just think there's something really cool about helping people shine in the moment that they're in right now in their life because, you know, tomorrow isn't promised. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my journey, it's that you have to treat every single day like it is a red carpet and like it is your special day. And I, I hope that when people work with me, they feel like they're unstoppable. Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me. Conversations with inspiring, empowering women. My name is Risa Costas, and I am a stylist, a personal shopper, a scourer and scouter of all things vintage and resale. I am also the CEO and co-founder of the Rescue Kit Company, which is a fashion emergency kit company. We also create styling tools for everyone who gets dressed so we can empower you to be your own hero in any situation when you're getting dressed for fashion emergencies and just looking great in front of the camera or on those big days in your life. And welcome to Sylvia and me. Risa, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I know you said you're a stylist and you said you're a personal shopper and so on and so forth. Um, and you are a stylist, you're a personal shopper, you're also a celebrity stylist. And the company, the other, the rescue uh, kit company, in fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, that product was included in the 2023 Oscar gift bags. And I is correct. you've got one of your favorite people there with you right now, don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a bar. No, no, no. It's all good. <laughs> Welcome to real life behind the scenes. My life is chaos. <laughs> okay. And you've had over 20 years in the fashion and beauty industries. Uh, you've been recognized internationally from San Francisco to New York City to Florence, Italy. And your work has been featured on the Today Show, Good Morning America, Vogue Italia, Puff Post, just to name a few. One of the things that I do want to read is something that you either wrote or said. I believe you wrote it, because it really, to me, says so much about you. Let nothing hold you back, not how you look, not what degree you do or don't have, not money, not relationship status, not society, not any one hater, nothing. You can do it, and I believe in my heart that if you want it, it's yours for the taking. And it's not just a question of words. Words mean something. As they have sustenance. I want to go back to the start of your journey. And it started with a horrific accident when you were 17 years old. Without going into too much detail about the specifics of what happened, because I did hear that. You were 17 and high school was just ending and you were getting ready to go off to college. What were you looking to do and what happened? So I was at that time really ready to get out of high school. And, you know, I had experienced a lot of bullying growing up and I then of course experienced this accident and I just felt like the hits kept coming. And at that time in my life, it was, you know, my parents were going through a divorce and things were not feeling really great in my life. So I couldn't get wait to get out of my small town. I couldn't wait to just have a fresh start. And I was set to go off to the university of Maine and be a cheerleader. So I'd made the cheering team there and, you know, we couldn't really afford for me to go really far out of state or out of state in general. And um, I was excited that I made the cheering team, but it really was just, I think, and now that I think about it and we're, and we're having this conversation, I think it was a way for me to sort of dive into something, especially after what had just happened to me. And 
luckily I found out that my coach was head of the athletic promotions and got to choose to sing the national anthem. So in my heart of hearts, I wanted to be a singer. That was my end goal. I grew up singing, acting, dancing, doing sports and everything, but what made me the happiest and what made me the most excited was taking the stage at any point in time. And I thought maybe there was a future for me in singing. But as soon as the accident happened, I was left with a facial scar and it was so disheartening in so many ways. It wasn't just about being left with a very obvious scar that took over my entire right cheek, but it was just this blow to my confidence. Like what, who's going to want to hire me now? Who would give me a job? Who's going to want to even look at me on a stage? Um, and I think sometimes we take for granted how we look and how our health is and, and what we have going for us. And in that moment, I was sort of knocked down a little bit like, okay, you know, you are going to have to figure something else out. So I did go off to school and I did still sing the national anthem, which was amazing. I got to sing on televised games for hockey tournaments and basketball and football games. And I, I did throw myself into cheerleading. Um, and I also ended up, you know, changing my major. My mom wanted me to be a speech pathologist, which was not in the cards. <laughs> uh, but she wanted me to make sure that I had a secure job when I came out of school. And, you know, this was like in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I graduated high school in 99. And it was really taboo not to have a plan and have a job that you knew you would have job security in. So I ended up changing my major to a vocal major behind my mom's back. and still singing and just, and, and wanting, that's really all I wanted to do was just to, to cheer and to sing. And I think I, I always thought entertainment and taking the stage was a way for me to escape what, like it is for most artists. And it was a way for me to just really be somebody else in that moment. And I felt like I really needed it then more than ever. So, um, I did end up having to leave school because of some PTSD and, and some neurological issues and memory loss uh, from the accident that really didn't kick in until about a year and a half into school. Uh, and that's when I knew, okay, life is, is about to become really, really different. And um, back in the late 90s, the 2000s, traumatic brain injuries were not really talked about. It's not, they weren't really talked, they weren't talked about. Um, and you were on your own. Mm -hmm. How did you, I know that you've said some of your peers, some of your friends did kind of an intervention and made you see that you, that things weren't exactly, uh, right, that you needed help mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen overnight. So how did you take how did you have the temerity to to move forward you school was not working out for you how did you really move forward I know that you didn't really have your as you said your parents were going through a divorce you were on your own I was you know my mom was an educator and felt really strongly about me finishing my degree and I tried to tell her that something wasn't right I think she only knew what she knew in the time, which was that if you didn't finish school, you were not going to have a future. That was just the mentality of my parents' generation. And I had to advocate for myself. I knew that in that moment that I wasn't mentally able to handle what was coming at me especially with what was going on in my brain. And it felt so out of body and nobody was talking about TBI and nobody was talking about the road less traveled and a different path other than a four-year school. You know, where I was from in a small town in Maine, it was, you go to school, you graduate, you meet the love of your life, you have children, you get a dog, you buy a house, like your life is perfect, you know? And it's just, I knew that that wasn't going to work for me. And I don't think that anyone meant to leave me alone. I had my grandmother who I was extremely close with and she was always in my corner and she believed in me so much. Um, and I know my parents believed in me too, but as we learn, when we become adults, adults have their own issues, their own adult issues. And yes, they do. they're still trying to navigate their own life. Like I think about how 
old my parents were when I was in college and they were still young and they were about my age now. And, and I'm just starting to understand what it means to have boundaries and to do the personal work and to do the growth work. And I don't know, I think, you know, we don't know that at the time we're not, it's not their job to say like, Hey, I'm going through my own things. Like they just, they have to do the best they can. So I don't, nobody meant to leave me alone, but there's a certain thing that happens in that time when you are left to your own devices. And it certainly happened for me. I knew that I had to dig really deep and grit and resilience have always been a huge part of who I am. I'm somebody who jumps without really looking and knows that I can trust myself. And I think the work that I had to do in that time was to really become my own cheerleader and, and really advocate for the path that I was about to go on. And I didn't even know what that was going to look like, but I'm a problem solver at heart. And it's interesting that I made a career now out of problem solving for other people, because like when you start to get older and you, and the dots start to connect, you really realize like why you were put in those certain situations. So Although I was physically alone, I know like mentally I was there for myself in a way that has served me really um, in my life this whole entire time. And so you pivoted, you found an area that really kind of mixed. No, you, you weren't going to be on stage. You weren't going to be a cheerleader. You weren't going to be a Broadway actress but you found your calling, if you want to say, your passion in something that helped you and has since helped so many other women. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, I believe you, you went to cosmetology school. You're and, right. <laughs> and, you know, as you mentioned, you had a facial scar that you were left with from this horrific accident when you were 17. So that also helped you figure out how to, as we're all looking to figure out how we can hide whatever or cover up whatever we have. In doing that, you've taken that 5 million steps further. <laughs> so when you first started back going to school, how did that make you feel? How did you start to realize that this is what you want to do? This is where life is starting to take you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I realized that I'm really good with people. I really do a great job of lifting other people up. I think that's the ultimate cheerleader in me, right? So I have always been an advocate for other people, especially after going through so much bullying in grade school. I knew that I never wanted anybody to feel the way that I felt. And I didn't realize that that was my passion. I didn't realize people were my true passion. Um, I think I have something inside of me that allows me to just learn anything, soak anything up. And I just guess harness the inner power that I have. And my, my mom had said to me, you know, if you're not going to finish school, you need a trade or something that you can do. And those words really stuck with me. Like, well, what am I good at? And what do I love? And my mom was a seamstress and would make all my clothes. And I really took my fashion seriously growing up. I always wanted to wear something really different. I was always doing weird things like putting my watch on my ankle and trying to be a trendsetter. And I always spent my allowance money on clothes while my sisters would save it for vacations. And then they would come in my closet and steal my clothes. So there was always this fashion girl inside of me and somebody who really loved expressing myself through getting dressed. And there wasn't really, I'm, like I said, I'm from a small town in Maine. So the closest city was Boston. And then the closest really big city was New York. And I knew I didn't really have the means to get to New York at the time, but I had gone, I had grown up going back and forth to Broadway shows with my mom um, every year. They took us to the Rockettes. They took us to um, Broadway. I saw all the best shows and got to wear all the cutest little outfits that my mom would make for me. And the rush of going to the city and just the feeling that I had when I would go to those places, it was always inside of me. Um, but I knew I needed to get somewhere that would offer me a better opportunity. So after 
taking on some random jobs before going to Boston, I did decide hair school was probably going to be the vehicle to get me to the next thing. You know, there were no YouTube tutorials. There were no real makeup lessons anywhere, if you will, unless you went to New York or Hollywood. And I didn't even really know what Hollywood was at the time. So I decided to go to hair school because I knew it would provide me a license that did hair, skin and nails and would broaden my, my chances for getting a job somewhere. So I did finish school and I ended up working at a salon on Newbury street in Boston, which was a really big deal. And they had a chair waiting for me there while I was training. And a, and a girlfriend of mine happened to call me um, after I had just done my first wedding for a friend. After, you know, she, she said to me, will you do my hair and makeup for my wedding and my maid of honor? And I thought, really? <laughs> I have no formal experience doing this. And she's like, yeah, I trust you more than anybody. And we had, we had, we knew each other well. And, and I think she was so young and just wanted somebody there that she trusted. And that would ultimately be the backbone for this business that I have built today, which is really being somebody's best friend on their biggest day of their life and, and being the person that holds their hand. I had no idea that I also sang in her wedding, which was awesome, but I, I had no idea that I could be the person that would not only be able to coach them through the day and hold their hand, but to provide a service for them and to be a part of their big day. And it was, I had no idea what that would become. And it was interesting that she trusted me to do that because it allowed me to launch my first career at 21. I ended up leaving the salon in Boston and moving to San Francisco with a few girlfriends randomly across the country. No idea what San Francisco looked like or where it even was on a map. And when I got there, I just started telling people, oh, I'm a hairstylist and makeup artist for weddings. Do you want me to do your wedding? And I did I ended up doing hair and makeup for like 12 brides or so all on my own and their bridal parties. And I think about that now and think to myself, how on earth did I do that by myself? But I just did it. Even if it took three trials and just making sure that I knew what I was doing, I was self-taught and I was determined and I knew that I didn't have the degree to back me up. So I better have the personality and the grit and the wherewithal to just say, I can do this and show people that I am hireable and I'm, I'm worthy of, of doing the work and getting paid what I deserve. And as you said, the grit, you've talked about journeys. You've talked about the fact that, you know, there's next chapters and you, and, and chapters. And, and as far as I'm concerned, there's always another chapter because if there isn't, then how boring is it? Mm -hmm. And you've proven that you can continue opening up doors, that you're not afraid to take a step across that threshold and see what's next, because you were doing brides, you were doing that in San Francisco. Um, you now are in, in Phoenix, you're in mm -hmm. Arizona, you've got a thriving styling business. Um, you do some other things also. But I know that one of your your mantras or your themes is how can I help women in their day to day lives look and feel more confident so they can face the day and know their own strength. And mm -hmm. that is not just showing somebody, oh, this is in today. You know, this color looks good on you. To me, it's more of getting to know the person, getting them to open up. So that, as you know, is said, they're wearing the clothes, the clothes aren't wearing them. Their hairstyle mm -hmm. is not wearing them. They're shining through. How did you, how did you be able to spread yourself and actually spread your wings to doing something like that? Well, I never thought I would end up with a styling business. I, I mean, that was just so out of the blue and so random. And I think a lot of times people are searching for what's the thing that's going to make them the money or what are they passionate about? And let's turn that into a business and all the things. But I, I truly believe that if you just stay authentic to who you are and keep putting yourself out there and, and network and never burn a bridge, that your passion will ultimately just surface 
and it will just come out through your pores and it will it will shine through and that will be the thing that brings the money or brings the relationships or brings the happiness really truly because for me i i knew that when i was living in san francisco i had this feeling like weddings were going to be a part of my life i had this feeling like I'm really good at dressing people. I'm also really good at consulting on the head to toe look. Like I knew what a finished look should be. And I would always watch the red carpets and say, Ooh, I loved that dress, but I would have worn her hair this way, or I would have done this shoe, or I would have, I don't know, maybe hemmed it a little bit different, did a, did a different alteration. Um, so I was always able to have that discerning eye. And, you know, I just, I felt like the underdog for so long in my life. Like I'm not good enough. I don't have a degree or, you know, I'm going to have to work extra hard and I'm going to have to prove to people that I can do it. And so what that does to you when you feel like you're coming up from behind is it just, it forces you to work so much harder and to show people your worth in a way that maybe somebody that has the degree or the comfort of a privilege doesn't feel they need to do and for me, it was like, I can do all of these things, right? Like I've been around a seamstress. I've been, I've been in the fashion industry now. When I worked in San Francisco, I, I fell into a, my first fashion job that took me all over the world and showed me every small eensy weensy thing that there was that went into creating your own business and, and running a startup. And I got a front row seat to some of the coolest things that people just don't get an opportunity to do. And it's because I felt an extra push to put myself in those situations and introduce myself to everyone I could and shake the hand of every single person who walked through the door of the day spa that I was working at while I fell into this job. And, you know, I, I said yes to everything. I said yes to a Saturday job working in a boutique because I was shopping in there so much that I was dressing every patron who walked through the door. And finally they offered me a job, not only working in the store on Saturdays, but as a buyer, as a guest buyer, they're like, wait, you have a really good eye. Will you do this? So I was always doing three or four jobs at a time and just throwing myself into everything, which is what I think your twenties are for. Um, and for me, it was like, well, I have to throw spaghetti against the wall because I don't have a backup plan. Like, I don't know exactly where I'm going to shine and what I'm going to be good at. So the way that I was able to start my business today is by doing everything that I possibly could from hostessing and waitressing to, like I said, working in a boutique and working at a day spa and saying yes to a you know, a job at a handbag and shoe company, and then leaving that and moving back across the country to go do PR in the fashion industry in New York City, which I had no experience in. So, you know, I think when you are somebody who feels like they might have something to prove, or you feel behind in life, or you feel like maybe people are questioning your worth, it it, it does a little something to you. And it, and it keeps a spark ignited in you that a lot of people lose along the way. And, and most people will choose a comfortable job that they're going to stay in for, you know, five to seven years, whatever that average is nowadays, it's probably not seven anymore, but they're going to choose that comfort route. Right. And I didn't have that luxury. I didn't have that choice, but I don't think that even if I was given it, that I'm really built that way. I, I just don't, don't think it's me. I don't think so. <laughs> I think it took you the, all of the, Horrific incidents that happened, the bullying, the accident, the um, the surgeries that you needed to go through, the feeling of needing to be out there, everything you pushed yourself to do has given you the confidence that you're really, you're damn good. <laughs> and, and let me tell you what I said at the beginning, where, you know, what you've said is let nothing hold you back. And you haven't. So you are an inspiration to so many women. And as you mentioned, you were talking about the red carpet, I do believe that didn't you get to have your own red carpet on your local uh, channel this year for the Oscars or was that so last I, year? 
Uh, actually, this year I was I was asked. Um, I do a lot with Local Channel Three, so Your Life Arizona, and I got to do a post Oscars red carpet recap segment, which oh, was cool. That's even really better. exciting. Yes, I haven't had my own red carpet moments, but uh, I love dressing people for the red carpet, and I love talking about the red carpet. You know, I'm really passionate about just what happens behind the scenes with stylists and designers getting a look to come to life for somebody, and I hate to choose a best or a worst dressed. I mean, but it's always hard because, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. If anyone knows that, it's me. And I think what we have to keep in mind is when we look at somebody's look, they made a choice that day or somebody made a choice with them or maybe they're wearing something because it means something to them. And maybe wow. they're wearing something because that color has special meaning or that silhouette reminds them of somebody who's passed in their life and they want to honor them on their most special day. I just think that's the beautiful thing about fashion and style is that we get to choose and we get to tell our own story. And there's something really special about where my journey aligns with what I'm doing now and how I'm helping women tell their story through what they get to wear. And there are so many talented stylists out there. There are so many talented dressers and people who work in the fashion industry. And there are so many talented influencers who don't necessarily dress other people, but they know how to dress themselves really well. I mean, everyone has this like unique talent, but I shouldn't even say, but, and what I've gotten to do is help bring that out in women and hold their hand and collaborate with them. When I'm, when I'm dressing somebody, it isn't just, oh, you're wearing this. There's a whole conversation that goes on behind it. And when I work with a high profile client or even just a mom who wants to feel a certain way that day because she's just going through some postpartum struggles or whatever it is, like there's a whole conversation. There's a dialogue that happens. There's coaching that happens. There's budget we have to keep in mind, or there's just a lot of, of, choice and a lot of conversation that we have. So my job is so, is so much more than just going to a store, plucking a piece of clothing and putting it on somebody. It's about understanding the human behind the clothing. Like you said, it's about helping them to wear the clothes as, a, as opposed to vice versa. And it's about celebrating who, who they are in this moment right now, because that's all we have is right now. Like whatever happened yesterday, whatever we wore yesterday, like that's over unless we repeat the outfit later, but it's still <laughs> going to be a new day and you're still going to look different on that day. So I just think there's something really cool about helping people shine in the moment that they're in right now in their life, because, you know, tomorrow isn't promised. And if there's one thing that I've learned in my journey, it's that you have to treat every single day like it is a red carpet and like it is your special day. And I, I hope that when people work with me, they feel like they're unstoppable. Risa, well, you're unstoppable. And what you just said is so true and people don't understand. Everyone is, is so out there to rush to judgment. And instead of, we need to take a step back, take a breath, and realize that everyone has their own story. And what you do is you're, you're allowing these women, you're empowering them to tell their story, to mm -hmm. let that story come out. And I celebrate you, you for that because it's not, I mean, fashion, I love fashion. Um, Garment Center, to die for. Mm -hmm. Joan Rivers and her daughter, Melissa, on the red carpet was fantastic. What people don't understand is how much goes into it. And so thank you so much. If you had one thing, just one short thing to tell young women today with all the social media and all the influences and everything that is thrown at them, what would that be? Absolutely cut the noise and care less about, if, if at all, about what people think about you. I spent so much of my life worried about what other people thought about me and suffered so much embarrassment and shame around who I was that I suppressed a lot of the talent that I had that could have been shining through in a much bigger and brighter way when I was younger. 
And I want kids to understand that when you show up as your most authentic self, that's when people gravitate toward you. And that's when you can shine the biggest and brightest. It's taken me 42 years to really show up unapologetically. And the response that I'm getting is overwhelming. And I had no idea that if I just showed up exactly as I was, that it would bring out the most amazing people in my life and that it would also allow me to level up. And it would, it would show me that the right people will find you and you will find the right people if you just live exactly as you are. So to young kids out there that might be listening to this or that might hear this one day, your uniqueness is what is your gift and it's what makes you the most special human and the world needs your gifts specifically. It doesn't need somebody else's. It doesn't need you to pretend to be somebody else. It needs your gift specifically. And I've found myself lately doing a lot of things today for the younger version of myself to show her that, you know, it's never too late, first of all. Um, and that she was perfect exactly as she was. So go out and be you, specifically you, because that's, that's what the world needs. We don't need a bunch of copycats. Absolutely not. Risa, where can people find out more about you? They can visit my website at risacostas.com. And that will take you to the Rescue Kit Company as well. So the com, And then they can find me on Instagram, which is where I'm the most active, at Risa Costas. And I have to say that on Instagram, you're out there. You are at times raw. You are real. And um, that's where I found you. So Risa, thank you so much for, for having this conversation today. Thank you for giving me the platform to do it and for seeking me out and just what you're doing for people and women out there on your podcast is amazing. So, so keep going. Thank you. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course, our website, sylviaandme.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, stay tuned.